Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? We've seen some major announcements out of the camera manufacturers in 2018. Full frame mirrorless is in force. But the question that I have, is this simply an evolution or are we at the beginning of a revolution? So I am joined this time by a very special guest, Jordan Drake from DP Review. He and his kind of partner in crime, Chris Nichols, put on an absolutely excellent show. They've been reviewing cameras and photo gear for a very long time. I've been a fan of them for quite a while. And we're going to just kind of talk about, I think, this whole mirrorless camera thing, right, Jordan? Yeah, absolutely. It's been a really exciting year. I mean, we've never, to the best of my knowledge, there's never been a year where so much happened, in, uh, honestly, within just a few months. And I think it's notable that we've finally seen a serious entry into the mirrorless market by kind of the last two big holdouts, right? Like Nikon had kind of its half-assed, you know, one series mirrorless lineup for a while. And fun fact, that's um, a J1 is actually what I first started shooting on YouTube with. And huh. then Canon, they've had a, a, I would say probably a better fleshed out mirrorless line for the last few years, but yeah. it's it's been kind of compromised too, right? It seems like now they're taking it seriously, but are they really? I mean, uh, you've gotten some hands-on time with like the EOS R. It yeah. seems like they kind of left some stuff on the table with that one. Well, I think what happened uh, earlier this year, Sony brought out their a7 III, mm -hmm. uh, which was a really exciting camera and I think was kind of the tipping point where we were seeing a whole bunch of professional features like professional autofocus, good battery life, all the issues that people had had with mirrorless cameras being addressed, but at a lower price point. And I think when Nikon and Canon saw that, they panicked. And I think they've been working on both of their systems for a really long time, because there's a lot that seems very fleshed out on it. But I feel like both of them had to cut corners in one area or another, just so they could get something out, you know, in time for the end of the year here. Um, because I was working at the camera store, which was my previous YouTube channel before we jumped over to DP Review, mm -hmm. when the a7 III came out. And my job was essentially helping people switch systems from Canon or Nikon to Sony for when that camera came out. Mm -hmm. uh, they had to do something to stop the bleeding. And yeah, both of those are really exciting, really weird cameras in a way, because they do all seem to be really well thought out in some areas. And some of it was just like, this thing has to be out, just whatever you got, throw it out there, you know, uh, get a 3D printer quick. <laughs> <laughs> 3D printing cameras. Yeah, and let's, uh, let's get these things to market. Right. Now, and that's, I think, the difference maybe between Nikon and Canon's offerings is surprising. I mean, one yeah. would think, because they've both really been dragging their heels in the mirrorless market, Nikon seemed to put on a better showing here, not only yeah. in the fact that they launched two models instead of just one, but I mean, I think you'd agree. It seems like they put some more serious effort into it. Yeah, and especially if we're looking at the camera side of things. Um, the Canon uh, just has a few features that we wouldn't expect from Canon. feels kind of buggy. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, that's something they've been known for, is you're not getting cutting-edge stuff with Canon, mm -hmm. but it's generally very, very reliable. Uh, I shot Canon for a long time and never had any issues with those cameras. Uh, where Nikon has really made serious inroads in the last few years because they've had, on their DSLR side, I would say the best autofocus out there. So mm -hmm. we saw a lot of sports, wildlife guys, all on that side of things. And then it seems like they both threw their primary advantages away. The Canon was certainly a less reliable, a little more buggy camera. I know um, I've seen a few things on YouTube where people have been starting to receive their cameras and they're just cratering very quickly. Mm -hmm. Where Nikon, the ergonomics on that camera are fantastic. Uh, the interface seems quite well thought out. And then they screwed up on the autofocus, which is the <laughs> one thing that they ha were head and shoulders above everyone else on. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's a weird thing. And it really is one of those situations where we've got a lot of people with a lot of those lenses kicking around. You know, those mm -hmm. are the big two out there. Uh, the majority of 
photography lenses or Canon and Nikon out in the world. So those people want to be able to use them on something. And I would certainly say these are cameras where if you've got a bunch of Canon glass or a bunch of Nikon glass kicking around, you know, it probably makes sense to get on one of these. But if you're coming in from scratch, I think both of those are just a little bit too restricted in one way or the other. Mm-hmm. I would maybe take a look at, you know, the Sony or some of the other sensor formats out there. And I think your your point about the lenses is a really good and interesting one too, in that with both Nikon and Canon, obviously, like you said, there are plenty of people out there with extensive and very expensive lens yeah. collections. And yeah, you can get adapters, and it seems like Nikon, at least their adapter, their native adapter works quite well. But both of them are shockingly good. Yeah. yeah. I was I was very surprised. But you kind of can't help but wonder, I mean, how many people do you think that would be, let's say they're already a Canon shooter. They've, you know, they've been shooting on a 5D series or whatever. They've got a decent number of full frame lenses and Mm -hmm. they finally realize, okay, I need to get into this mirrorless thing. I mean, how many of those people do you think are actually going to realize there is an adapter out there and it works well versus just thinking, oh, well, okay, so this new mirrorless thing needs new lenses and just going out and rebuying it all. I mean, do you think that could be an opportunity for other manufacturers to jump in and kind of, I guess, take advantage of that situation? Be like, hey, well, you know, if you're going to get rid of all your lenses anyway, you might as well look at a different brand. Exactly. And I think Sony had a big leg up there because they spent, you know, initially a lot of people are scared of adapters or something, Mm -hmm. but it's been almost five years that people have been talking about, oh, how do these lenses, adapted lenses work on the Sony bodies? Mm -hmm. Um, So I think if you're an enthusiast, it's the information is certainly out there. If you're the kind of person who's going to go on like watch photography, YouTube videos or things like that, what's surprising is uh, what I found really interesting since Canon and Nikon jumped on is that's not something a lot of pros do. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they're all, I'm a Canon shooter. I look and see what Canon comes out with or what Nikon comes out with. Uh, and those are the ones who are now like, oh, it was funny. I think it's probably my most popular tweet ever was watching pros pick up the EOS R and the Nikon Z series cameras for the first time. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh man, I can see my exposure in the viewfinder and a histogram and all this stuff we've taken for granted for, right. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like the 10 year anniversary of mirrorless right, right now. And they've had no clue because these people just don't look outside of their systems a lot of the time. Uh, so I do think for enthusiasts, that's why we're seeing this mass migration. And certainly I jumped on uh, Sony for a while. I'm mm-hmm. now mostly shooting micro four thirds, mm-hmm. uh, but I've got a lot of Canon glass and that is all still sitting on those bodies right now. Uh, I don't think it's a bulletproof option for autofocus. You know, when I'm trying to follow my kid running around, I right. am not using adapted lenses for it, but you know, if I'm doing video, especially it's generally manual focus and they're great for that. Mm-hmm. And I think it's worth pointing out cause you, you kind of touched on it a little bit that there's a big difference between like photography and camera enthusiasts and pros yeah. because the pros aren't necessarily, I don't want to say they're not technically savvy, but they're not necessarily thinking in terms of the technology, right? I mean, they're, yeah. they're probably more like half art and half business. Like I need to get this job mm-hmm. done. Like I'm thinking of someone who just does, you know, professional wedding photography how yeah. many of them, I mean, the, the camera is just a tool. It's not this thing that they're necessarily deeply interested in and they're following all the industry news and trends and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, does, and, and I'm sure you've worked with a lot of people like that, if not professionally, but, you know, in, in, when you were at the store. Yeah. I mean, do you think a lot of those people would actually be receptive to switching systems or are they just kind of like, you know what, I've always shot Canon and I'll just buy whatever they make or an icon or whatever? Yeah, it, it's such a huge investment on that. And it depends on the type of pro. Like, I mm-hmm. think we'll see more wedding shooters uh, and things like that switching over mm-hmm. uh, because typically the lens investment isn't quite as much as like the sports, yeah. wildlife, photojournalist side of things. Mm-hmm. You know, we're talking, yeah, if they've got some super tellies, like $50,000 yeah. in lens investments, and they're like, I want this thing to work perfectly. Yeah. I don't <laughs> want to worry about an adapter conking out. Yeah. But the other thing, too, is that because the mirrorless was kind of a slow move, I think a lot of people um, 
tried, say, a Sony A7 when they first came out, mm -hmm. or uh, like a Panasonic GF1 was kind of the first one that got people really excited. And in those situations, the cameras, they had some advantages, but they were also really restrictive. The EVFs weren't great on them. Mm -hmm. The autofocus wasn't good. And I think that made a lot of pros just like, oh, mirrorless is not the tool for me. Right. You know, I, I heard a lot of people talk about rangefinders, like... Their range finders are fun to shoot, but I would never use one for my work, right? right. Um, and I think that's how a lot of them saw it. Yeah, and I guess that that does raise an interesting point. I mean, we've seen dramatic improvements in mirrorless, but yeah, when they first came out, they they had a lot of things lacking. What do you think it's going to take to really kind of turn that tide, to get people to finally realize mirrorless is a legit option if not mm -hmm. mirrorless is the future i mean are we there we've we've seen pricing on these full frame bodies come down dramatically i mean two thousand bucks is us is kind of like the price to beat at this point yeah. everybody's got something at that mark and the cameras generally all work really well mm -hmm. are we there or do we still have a couple more generations to go I, th I do think this is really the tipping point, and I think everybody is kind of revisiting that. I know mm -hmm. I've seen a whole bunch of pros who are like, okay, I'm going to take another look at this now. And almost universally, once people do, they wind up jumping over. Like, mm -hmm. I really do think for professionals that mirrorless is a lot of the time a better tool, uh, yeah. you know, being able to preview exposure, things like that. And oh, yeah. so many of them, they have to do video now. That's I, I saw Reuters right. just said, like, we no longer have photographers and videographers anymore. Mm -hmm. We have media people and right. your job is to do everything. So a mirrorless is a way better tool for capturing video. You know, we're both on GH5s right now. Absolutely. Uh, so I think that's really driving it as well. But uh, yeah, in terms of the price point, this is where uh, one of the most successful cameras I ever saw when we were at the camera store was Nikon's D750. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time that we saw essentially a professional autofocus system in a $2,000 camera. And it was huge. So I think this is kind of following up on that, Mark. I can certainly say when I left the store uh, about seven months ago, we were still filling back orders for A7 threes, mm -hmm. and I believe that's still the case going into Christmas. You know, I, I think they've they're dumping a boatload of them, but it's still a camera that is hugely in demand right now. Uh, so I think this is really the sweet spot for it. And that that I guess kind of brings us to maybe the next part of it. In that is, you know, we've been talking about Nikon and Canon, kind of these stalwarts of the industry, and they the tr it's traditionally always been this battle between those two, right? Yeah. You either started on Canon or you started on Nikon and you stick with it unless you switch for whatever reason. But Sony is kind of like the OG of the mirrorless world in terms of yeah. really pushing that technology forward in a professional level. Mm -hmm. We're still waiting on a follow-up for the A7S series. Yeah. It's, it, I mean, I've, I've been following, I follow like the Sony rumors a lot, even though I'm not shooting Sony anymore. I think you and I actually have a very similar like flow as to our camera history. I started on Nikon, shot Sony APS-C cameras for a while, um, mm. and maybe we end up talking about this later, maybe not. But ultimately, I switched over to Micro Four Thirds, and yeah. I'm not looking back, but... You know, Sony really seems to be getting its act together in terms of professional support and its lens selection has dramatically improved in what, mm -hmm. just the last, what, two, three years, something like that. Yeah. With lenses that uh, some of the reviews seem like they're even better than what Nikon and Canon are putting out. Do you think Sony is going to keep ahead of Nikon and Canon or was this more of a, you know, because they were doing their own thing in this separate market, of course, they're going to have more advanced technology. But now that, you know, in quote, the big guys are, you know, on on this scene or getting into mirrorless, do you think it's more like Sony is going to kind of, you know, fall behind again? Well, Sony has one big advantage and that certainly their weakness was lenses before, and they've mm -hmm. really kind of figured that out. But you've got to remember that they're making the best sensors in the world, mm -hmm. and they're making Nikon sensors mm -hmm. has pretty much been confirmed at this point. Um, 
so they do have a huge leg up in that, you know, if Canon and Nikon say we want to make a pro body right now, uh, like a 1DX mirrorless or a D5 mirrorless, mm-hmm. uh, the perfect sensor for that would be the um, chip in the A9. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's super fast scanning, you know, 20 frames per second with continuous autofocus. Sony can just say, no, uh, we're going to hang on to yeah. that for our own line. <laughs> yeah. And they're kind of out of luck. You know, who do they right. go to at that point? Um, and I think that's going to give Sony a huge edge. And like you mentioned, too, I refresh Sony Alpha rumors more than any other rumor sites, even <laughs> yep. though my gear is Micro Four Thirds because it always tells you what's coming next. Mm-hmm. You know, constantly Sony sets the benchmark uh, and then everybody else knows how high they've got to jump in the next product cycle. Uh, I do think they've got a real technological edge, but I think there's a lot of advantages to some of the other formats in my house right now. It's Micro Four Thirds, and uh, my wife just bought into the uh, Fuji X series. Okay. Uh, yeah, we see some real advantages to some of those smaller formats. Yeah, because I know you, I, I seem to remember you've been kind of swooning for what is it, the X-T3? Uh, I really like the X-T3. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just a fun camera to shoot with. Uh, it has some real limitations, which is why... Mm-hmm. You know, like I'm hoping that we have a conversation that lasts more than 29 minutes today. So uh, <laughs> Panasonic's got a real leg in that regard. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and uh, it does still feel like, yeah, they're they're coming around to it, but they're they're pushing really hard. And I do think Sony's driving that a lot as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I like I was always a guy even back when I was shooting film. Uh, it was just a bag of small primes. Right. And I think that the Micro Four Thirds and the APS cameras are doing a better job emphasizing that aspect of it. And right. there's some beautiful primes for full frames. But if you look at pretty much everything that's come out with a couple exceptions this year, they're incredibly sharp, mm-hmm. but big prime lenses that people right. are putting out. Because they want something that when you look at a review, you know, it's easy to measure sharpness. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a little more difficult to measure things like out of focus rendition or just like, is it a small, light, easy to use lens? Yeah. And that seems to be a real priority for Panasonic, Olympus, and Fuji. Yeah. And I think that's probably the one thing that those, I guess you could call them smaller camera makers, really have as an advantage is they're kind of filling in the gaps, right? Yeah. I mean, Canon seems to be falling behind in video. I remember it wasn't that long ago when a lot of really high quality YouTube content was pretty much all universally shot on something like a 5D Mark III. Like that was the benchmark. You want good video 5D Mark III and it would cost you, but you'd get it. And then Sony kind of started to catch up with that, but that was more for short form kind of content. The Canons, the Nikon, Nikon, the Z series is picking up in video, it sounds like pretty decently or at least you yeah, know compared they're to very respectable Ni- yeah. i mean nikon was garbage for video before so i guess you can only go up from there but um but panasonic and that's one of the main reasons why i switched to the gh5 is yeah unlimited record time and then the big thing that pushed me away from sony was friggin overheating of the camera yeah that yeah, you had an, did you have an a6300 i had a 5100 okay um which was ridiculous I got yeah. to the point where, and I was shooting some some of these podcasts with it. At first, I'm like, okay, well, I just need to make sure that my podcasts are under 20 minutes long, because that's about the point where the camera would start to overheat. Right. And then I'm like, you know, this is stupid. So instead of breaking down and buying another camera or doing something else, I go and get a capture card. And so now I'm tethering <laughs> the camera to the capture card and recording directly to my computer's hard drive. And then that, of course, that you know, that works fine. Yeah. But what if I want to do that away from, you know, a computer or a laptop or whatever? Why and, would you ever want to leave your desk? Right. That's the, so, <laughs> so, Sony's APS-C motto. Stay at home. Yeah, plug in. That's pretty much it. And that's That was the most frustrating thing is I absolutely loved the footage that I was getting out of that camera. The, uh, you know, Sony did just as good of a job with its native APS-C lenses that it's been doing with its full frame lenses. Mm-hmm. But... I mean, I'd even just not even continue with shooting. It's like the heat would compound in that camera where I would shoot a five minute clip, pause for 30 seconds, shoot another four minute clip. If I'm just getting B-roll or whatever. And next thing I know, you know, after about a half an hour of that, the thing's showing the overheat warning. Yeah. Um, Whereas I've taken my GH5 outdoors on a sunny summer day. The sun is beating down on it. I'm shooting 4K 
it doesn't complain at all and just keeps going no. until the battery dies. Yeah, and that was really the tipping point for me because I loved the image out of the A6300. Mm-hmm. And a few years ago, we were shooting primarily with cinema cameras. Mm-hmm. Um, I just found, you know, I always say whatever helps me work faster is yeah, the best Yeah, you were on what, the for FS5 for a while? We did the whole, we did FS700, FS7, okay. FS5, and that's why I got the A6300. It mm-hmm. was a killer little B-cam for mm-hmm. us. You know, it's the same sensor size, all my glass will carry right over. Um, and that was pretty much right at the point where we started traveling a lot more for the show. And I learned very quickly that going through customs with an FS5 or an FS7 <laughs> is not a fun yeah. process. Yeah. So we jumped over to the A6300. And I remember very distinctly the Fuji X-T2 video was the breaking point. Mm-hmm. We're shooting in New York in the summer. Oh. Uh, it's pretty humid there. And we would get like one or two talking points. And we actually wound up shooting outside of a convenience store so I could cycle the batteries in and out of the cooler. Oh, um, <laughs> oh wow. Wow. Because I, I didn't have external recording for right. that. Uh, right. Yeah, we were just, and we're all standing around, you know, it's a deadline. We've only got this camera for a day trying to get this thing out. Right. Uh, and that was the real tipping point. And that, at, oh. right around that time, the GH5 came out where we tested it alongside the FS5 and FS7. Mm-hmm. And the image was just as good, if not a little bit better. Mm-hmm. So at that point, we're just like, you know, this is clearly the way to go. Yeah. And all my APS-C lenses, I can throw a speed booster on it and away we go. Yeah, and that's that's I think the other big interesting part about I guess these you know these other companies and Olympus is kind of in the same boat. They're not as video centric, but no, it seems like the the Panasonic and Olympus shooters at least seem to be a bit more invested in keeping up with what's going on with that platform, and mm-hmm. maybe they're a bit more savvy about it. I I would imagine that we're going to see more micro four third shooters using adapters for lenses than we'll ever see like you know canon and nikon shooter maybe even sony shooters doing that yeah well and i think the speed boosters were i I, certainly i saw it over in movie making and independent film land when Mm -hmm. i was working at the camera store uh just having the ability to slap a piece of glass that in a lot of ways gives you a bigger sensor you know two of the three advantages shallow depth of field and better low light you get both with those Mm -hmm. um so i think smaller sensors and then pop a speed booster on when you need it made a lot of sense for a lot of people Mm -hmm. where if you go to full frame uh you know you're buying more expensive lenses because they have to cover that larger chip and if you want the advantages of a speed booster you're throwing medium format lenses on it which are slow so there's no real advantage to it uh so i really think yeah micro four thirds super 35 for filmmaking i look at it that way a lot still right. have a lot of advantages because i've got multiple sensor sizes effectively mm-hmm. available to me when i do that and yeah certainly with full frame if i've got it i can stop that lens down but i always like to say one of my favorite lenses out there is the olympus 12 to 100 okay because it's like an ultra wide to a pretty respectable telephoto all mm-hmm. in one and if you looked at that in full frame equivalent that would be a 24 to 200 millimeter f8 right um which If someone made that lens for a full-frame camera and it was that small and light and sharp, I would buy it in a heartbeat. But I would be Mm -hmm. the only one, I think. So you just have the option. If it's constant aperture, yeah. That actually reminds me, back when I was a Nikon shooter, I still have it somewhere. I don't even know why I keep some of my old camera gear. Um, I was a big fan of the Nikon 18-200. to Yeah. If you remember that one, that, that was like their first super zoom. It, oh, wasn't, it broke like crazy back when I was well, the Well, the thing that started. I remember was lens creep was horrible on it. Like, yeah. don't bother trying to shoot down one-handed because you will be at 200 millimeters whether you like it or not. Yeah. Um, but it was just so useful because yeah. that was the only lens I needed to carry if I was out shooting stills. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, now, like, I think the best lens ever made is Panasonic's 12 to 35. Um, oh, I'm shooting on that right now. Actually. It's just usually it's, I go manual focus, but Chris has so all my useful. manual focus. <laughs> He's stealing all your gear. So <laughs> we, 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 we do tradesies, but you well, you might as well. I mean, you've got it all available. Why not? Exactly. Um, but I think that does actually raise a really interesting question is so if we're at that point where full frame is going mirrorless and i think that's pretty clear that yeah. that the all the major manufacturers have finally realized that whether canon and nikon like it or not they have to go that direction 
Yeah. Where does that leave the rest of the market? Like, where does that leave Nikon's DX lineup or Sony's APS-C cameras? If the prices keep coming down on full frame, is yeah. there any purpose that those smaller sensor cameras are going to serve? Yeah, I, because looking at the Canon and Nikon, I was saying before, a lot of it seems very refined, like they've put a lot of thought into this. Mm -hmm. And there certainly doesn't seem to be, I mean, we haven't heard anything about seeing Z mount um, uh, DX lenses. Mm -hmm. They haven't mentioned anything about that. Canon has specifically said that they're not going to make their M mount APS-C system compatible with their new RF. Right. So I do really think that they're going to let that go. Um, oh, okay. I, it just makes sense to, once these sensors get less expensive, and it's it's very similar to what we had back in the film days, right? Mm -hmm. One format per manufacturer was right. pretty standard with the exception of like Pentax and things like that. Yeah. Uh, because then they can just focus all their energies on one lens mount and the sensor isn't the major expense that it used to be. You know, we were just out shooting with a... Uh, a D1H the other day, Nikon's second professional SLR. Mm -hmm. And basically, you were paying for a sensor in that, and they were like, what is the cheapest thing that we can wrap around this <laughs> to get it to market? Right. Where nowadays, the sensor is a smaller part of the package. Yeah. So um, prices are going to continue to drop on that. And it does make sense for them to focus on something. You know, what was you mentioned, Sony have some good APS-C lenses, but they're old lenses. True. Uh, the stuff that's coming out that's good for it is like Sigma's making spectacular lenses for yeah. that format right now. Yeah. Um, but Sony just doesn't seem super invested in it, and I wouldn't be surprised at all to see them just shift their energies towards full frame at this point, because uh, mm. that's where they're having the most success. And I think Canon and Nikon will do something similar to that, because the difference between APS-C and full frame isn't that enormous uh right you know i know there's some people who have nikon d500s and d5s or like a canon 7d and a 5d4 mm -hmm. um, but generally they're just doing that to get the speed for less money but these right. cameras are smoking fast now right. you know it's not really an image quality difference i think the most interesting is what panasonic's doing mm -hmm. because there's a big gap between micro four thirds lens size and price and full frame mm -hmm. so if you're a landscape photographer or someone who needs that kind of quality, then the full frame makes a lot of sense. But you could also have people shooting for their travel kit or their video kit with micro four thirds, mm -hmm. and you're not expecting them to upgrade. You know, like the right. DX was always an entry point, and it was always like, well, buy full frame glass so you're future proof and you can eventually move right. into that world. Where Panasonic, I could see a lot of people, you know, potentially myself included, if these S1 cameras turn out to be good, mm -hmm. use, having two things from the same manufacturer in two different systems. I got my mm -hmm. lightweight travel and video kit, and then I've got my serious high megapixel uh, high-end photography camera. Uh, I think that's a really smart move they're making. Mm -hmm. And Fuji's doing the same thing. They've mm -hmm. got, you know, uh, APS-C or small baby medium format. Uh, by just skipping the full frame. So there is a real quality jump when you go from one to the other. Right. Where APS-C sensors have gotten so good. Uh, yeah. You know, I remember with the uh, A6300 and the A7 II, there wasn't that much of a difference in image quality mm -hmm. between the two. And one of them was way less expensive, way faster shooting, way better autofocus. Right. So I guess that then I'm kind of wondering, I mean, if, if you're thinking Canon Nikon... Sony even are going to just be given up on APS-C, where does that leave kind of the lower end of the market? I mean, we know that point and shoots with rare exception, they're pretty much dead. Everyone's just yeah. using their phone for that. But, and granted, it's been a long time since I've really even gone hands on with like DSLR, you know, crop sensor cameras, but it still seems like there's some reasonable demand for people wanting to upgrade from a smartphone but just for personal use, you know, like yeah. the the parents who, you know, have kids that are going through school and they want something to shoot their sporting events or whatever. So like your kind of classic 500 or $600, you know, kit where you get like the, you know, a, a standard and a long range zoom and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of a lower end DSLR body. I mean, where's that going to go when the manufacturers give up on that? Or do you think we're really going to reach a point where the prices for bodies and lenses in full frame can get that low? Well, I think, I think they're going to 
get to that point. The problem is going to be lenses for full frame are still mm-hmm. going to be expensive if you do that. I was seeing a really interesting shift uh, before I left the store, and I think we're seeing it in a lot of the sales data as well, where um, you've got something like the Pixel 3 coming out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, everyone, it, I was just in Seattle with the team at DP Review there. And, you know, that was before we made it public. But yeah, it's performing a little better than a lot of the micro four third sensors out there, this Mm -hmm. smartphone camera and low light and in terms of dynamic range. Uh, So for that kind of like casual snapshot shooting and stuff like that, that's going to go away. So one of them, I I do think so at the entry level, Hmm. Um, but big zoom is still something that they can't do effectively. And I'm seeing a lot of interest suddenly in these higher end bridge cameras, something like the RX 10 series from Sony or the FZ series from Panasonic, because they're giving you better quality than your phone with a big zoom. And I see that could really start to become the lower end of the market. uh, I think we'll start to see some movement there because if you're doing the kind of photography like travel pictures and group shots where a 28 millimeter or 24 mil lens is fine, Mm -hmm. then yeah, your smartphone is really damn good right now. Um, you know, I would much rather have that than say like a Canon rebel with an 18 to 55 lens right now. Um, because it's a hell of a lot smaller, it's better for video and you have it with you anyways. Uh, so I think that's why we're seeing the whole industry move up market at this point, uh, right. because the enthusiasts and the professionals are the people who are still buying cameras right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think they're going to focus, you know, what we're already seeing. When was the last time Sony brought out an exciting DX lens. They brought out that 18 to 135 this year, which is a good lens, mm-hmm. but it's super expensive. It's not exciting in any regard. Yeah. Sigma's going to do more interesting stuff. Uh, I think we're going to keep seeing that. And as honestly, as photography becomes a little bit more niche in terms of people actually bringing a camera around with them, mm-hmm. things are going to have to get a little bit more expensive because it's not like that wonderful boom 10 years ago where every new parent was buying a rebel or a Nikon D 3100. Right. So that's going to make for a really interesting landscape, basically where you've got smartphones picking up, I would say the majority of photography and video duties. And then the middle of the market is basically gone, right? So you're at, This very small sliver of people wanting like that RX-10, which incidentally I shot on an RX-10 for about a year. um, And I'm really disappointed that Sony kind of ruined that series. (laughs) I know. I keep saying the RX-10 2.2. That's what everybody wants. I'm seriously like, I just bought a second. I would snap one up in a heartbeat. (laughs) I just bought a second GH5 body because they, you know, went on sale over the, the holiday break here. Yeah, but I'm still I'll admit I still occasionally kind of keep an eye out for a good deal on a used RX 10 2. Yeah, because that was the sweet spot. You finally got 4K, but they didn't they hadn't screwed with the lens and you still have the ND filter and the ND filter. It seems like it's such a small thing. I really miss that. Yeah, I really, really miss that. Well, especially uh, we stopped using faders a long time ago, Mm -hmm. because if you pan with those past a reflective surface, you see all kinds of weirdness happen in the shot. So, yeah, I would say about a third of my job now is screwing on (laughs) and off ND filters when we're out. Because I I noticed, like, I watched one of your documentaries, and yeah, when you're outside, you're shooting at a nice natural shutter speed, it looked like, on that. I so. had to ND the shit out of that. Yeah, 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 right? It's a huge pain, but I, I'm so uptight, I'm like, I won't do it. You know, when you've got it at the push of a button, oh man, that's that's oh, hard to, to get away from. That's the biggest thing I missed. The FS5 had what I thought would be in every camera by now. It had an electronic variable ND right, filter. Right. Uh, it was stepless. You just dial in whatever you need, or you could even set it to do smooth auto adjustments with it. So when we were doing like big tracking shots mm-hmm. on a gimbal, mm-hmm. it was the best thing ever. And I thought by this point, everyone right. would be like, oh, that's the future. I want that. And we still haven't really seen that. I'm really excited. Um I don't know if you saw the announcement. There's an organic sensor cinema camera coming mm-hmm. from Panasonic. And mm-hmm. that's something that effectively has a built-in ND right on the sensor. You yeah. just dial in its native sensitivity. And that I'm really excited about. Because I said before, we just pick up cameras based on what can be good enough and let us move and get stuff out really quickly. Right. Um, 
And speaking you know, of speaking of Panasonic, um, they're kind of the dark horse, right? Because I mean, you touched yeah. on like with the cinema thing. I don't think a whole ton of people realize that they are doing cinema cameras too. Um, yeah. Everyone just kind of really knows them for like the small pocketable Micro Four Thirds stuff, and then of course the GH lineup. But man, the S1, we don't know a ton about it yeah. yet, and price I think is really going to be the make or break on that. But yeah. I mean, it, it, could this really be kind of an upset that the underdog has, like, with where they're going? Well, I think they, it feels like this one's been in progress for a lot longer. You know, mm -hmm. they did the legwork, they've got Leica and Sigma working with mm -hmm. them. And I, I would say, like, I shoot mostly on Sigma glass, I don't know about you, but I think they're making some of the nicest lenses mm -hmm. out there right now. Um, and Canon and Nikon really screwed themselves, I think, not opening up their lens mount to third parties. That's They're true. like, nope, you guys have to reverse engineer it. So it'll be years until we have lenses working properly on this, where mm -hmm. I think we're going to see a ton of exciting stuff out of Panasonic. And yeah, they checked a lot of boxes. They have the built-in stabilizer that Canon got hammered over. And Panasonic autofocus is weird. Have you shot a lot of stills with your GH5? I've shot a few um okay i don't want to get because it's a long story but actually the very first gh5 body i bought the shutter mechanical shutter was dead out of the box well they're like who needs it this is yeah okay. <laughs> well the problem is it got stuck closed so oh, it rendered the more of a camera useless um so i'm like oh this is a great first impression two thousand dollar camera body and i can't freaking use it um yeah. So I've I've been a little apprehensive about shooting too much with it, but I've been getting into it, and if, I'll admit I've actually got the thing just locked onto electronic shutter because I'm not doing a ton of still work. But I right. have noticed some weirdness with the autofocus, and even on the video side, they they have been getting better. Panasonic yeah. gets a lot of credit because they keep pushing firmware updates for this mm -hmm. camera that's like two years old at this point, adding features and all that. But yeah. it's still like trying to do the tracking autofocus. It in video it's rocky yeah yeah sometimes it's got it and when you finally think okay it's really got it and i'm good it loses it and you're like what you know yeah yeah and I mean, the reason i mentioned still specifically like for video i think it's just the it works the processor really hard to mm -hmm. be trying to track that mm -hmm. with photo it's a weird experience because with the dfd it kind of like wobbles to oh, track right. a subject where right. it's because it's moving in front and behind right you get very, that little jittering kind of going on yeah yeah so you know if i'm shooting someone running towards me it's a bizarre experience because <laughs> it looks like it's all out of focus when i'm shooting my burst and then i get it in the computer and panasonic's focus like crazy uh they're excellent that way mm -hmm. but i think they really have to get that sorted out mm -hmm. in photography land to be taken seriously right because uh, the shooting experience is important you know if i were shooting sports all day like yeah it might be awesome when i get back to my computer everything is nice and sharp and in focus, but I'm still looking at an out of focus wobbling image the right. entire time I'm doing it. And one of the big reasons I think everyone should go mirrorless is the experience while you're shooting is I think better, you know, mm -hmm. being able to have the live preview, all your assist tools, things like peaking, all that there, uh, they've got to kind of sort that out. And I hope they do with the S1 and the S1R. Uh, they're saying they've got some new tweaks to their DFD autofocus system, but I just want it to be fun to shoot with. You know, I think that's why yeah. my wife and I jumped on the Fuji is, mm -hmm. you know, in some ways uh, I prefer the Panasonic cameras. In some ways I prefer the Fujis, but you can't deny and everybody says the same thing. Fujis are fun cameras to yeah. take pictures with. So when I go out with my kid, it's always the Fuji in a small prime. And that's a great kind of kit. I mean, I think primes are still totally underrated, even though as I'm filming this on a zoom lens, that's a good zoom. Um, I mean, the, the the first lens I bought for the GH5 was the 25mm f1.7. Yeah. Um, that's kind of just the classic. And for a long time, that's the only kind of lens that I had when I was on the, the Nikon 1 series. Um, mm -hmm. Everything was just shot with a prime, and I just figured out how to make it work. Although that reminds me, and I think you do actually deserve some credit for this one. Panasonic's coming out with, what is it, a 10 to 25 F17? Yes. How yeah, many I mean, millions of dollars do you think that thing's going to cost? I, it, it's tough to say because it's pretty close to a Sigma 18 to 35 equivalent, right? Mm -hmm. Except it goes even wider. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it should be a similar amount of glass uh, for that. Um, so 
Hopefully it's like I've seen the images and it's big, but it doesn't look ridiculous. I right. hope they price it accordingly because that could really uh, micro four thirds, the GH5, I think, and the G85 are keeping that system really viable because mm-hmm. so many bloggers and video people love it. Yeah. That lens could really be a decisive thing if they price it well. I think a whole lot of people will just be like, you know what, GH5 or GH5S and that lens is good enough. It, yeah. It'll replicate a cinema camera effectively. Uh, and the Sigma 1835 is one of my favorite lenses. You mentioned, you know, I, I don't know, I'm not going to take credit for being responsible for that, but a couple of years ago, we were at the Panasonic factory in Japan, mm-hmm. and the lens engineers are like, why are you strapping a Sigma to our beautiful camera? <laughs> uh, and it was on a speed booster, and I was like, yeah. oh, let's take a look at this. And, you know, that lens was not super new at that point, but it wasn't as ubiquitous as it is now. You know, if you go online and people are like, I need a combo, what do I get? And everyone says GH5 Speed Booster 1835. You know, Mm -hmm. that's such a common setup now. So they, yeah, sat there and looked at it and called some other people over. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they didn't speak great English, the uh, lens engineers. So we were kind of talking back and forth through our host. And uh, then, yeah, I, it, uh, Photokina this year, I see the announcement like coming essentially an 1835 yeah, native. The exact lens the, that you were telling them they need to make. Exactly. And uh, my big question now, and I can't get a straight answer on this, is will it actually have a mechanical focus ring? Yeah. Because if you watch the video version of this podcast, you've probably seen me leaning forward and second guessing <laughs> the panels because I can't see the damn number on the lens and make sure because sometimes it'll continuously like I, I, oh. I don't know if I turned off the continuous autofocus in the thing oh. so I'm, I'm digging around with it and I just want give me right a manual focus ring that I turn it right. to a number and it stays there and I can hyperfocal everything because that's how I learned you know growing right. up but well, I mean, honestly, I'm yeah. a dinosaur. More and more, a real manual focus ring, I think, is going to start to disappear now that both Canon right. and Nikon and Sony are doing focus by wire lenses. Yeah, I mean, focus by wire definitely has its pros and cons, and I'm kind of with you. I I run very occasionally one of those real just metal only dumb lens adapters to yeah. go to just an absolutely old school Nikon FE lens. Mm-hmm. All mechanical. It's a 50 millimeter F1.8. So the thing, it's like super zoom in. You know, it's a yeah. 100 mil equivalent on yeah. the GH5 body. But I can do just awesome focus pulls on that. Yeah. But at the same time, I mean, the software is kind of catching up where even in the GH5, I love the fact that I can just have the camera do the focus pull for me. Yes. Yeah. If you've got the time to set that up, it's a really sweet feature. And uh, with linear focus too, I was talking to Sony for a couple of years and they're like, look, if you want linear and they have linear focus on a few of their lenses now mm-hmm. where, you know, if you take your hand and you rotate it to the same point twice in a row, it'll wind up at the same place. Right. My Panasonic won't do that. Unfortunately, right. you know, depending on how fast I rotate, I'll wind up in two totally different places. Mm-hmm. Uh, they said, we've got to build the lens ring custom for that. Um, hmm. So we're starting to see a few from them, but then Fuji just, opened up firmware for the xh1 and the xt3 and it's like linear focus in the menu yeah, system Turn and it, it works done. with <laughs> and it works with all their old lenses so yeah. i hope that's something where we're just gonna see you know okay. we gave nikon a really hard time for that because um, <laughs> we were able to talk to them directly yeah uh the canon is very close to linear it's okay. not not bang on every time right. but uh yeah i want to see everybody moving in that direction and that'll help a lot but i'd still much rather just have like just give me a distance scale on it or right. an option to right. have the focus by wire distance scale on there and then lock and i don't have to worry about it again you know something like that yeah the workaround i've been doing on mine is you know they've got the focus select dial on the back of the gh5 yeah a, a feature that i actually really like about it is i leave the thing set to manual focus but i've got the auto exposure button in the middle of it remapped yeah. as a focus button Ah, so it's you, effectively, you, it's a single shot focus button. While I was furiously second guessing myself while we were recording this <laughs> podcast, you might see a little wobble where I was just like, you know what? I'm rolling. I can't do punch in focus right now. Screw it. I'm going to trust the autofocus. And I think right. I hit. We'll, fi- we'll find out afterwards. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's finding little tweaks, but I think maybe kind of. I just the, don't want workarounds like that, right? I, well, I just, right. Yeah. It's, it, and you kind of got to pick your battles. And maybe that's the other pro and con, I guess, to kind of come full circle with this whole, you know, mirrorless really is the revolution 
and not the yeah. evolution is so much of it's going to be software based and yeah. It's just a matter of getting the camera companies the information that photographers want in the field, actual working photographers to get them to put it in. It doesn't cost them as much to do a lot of that kind of stuff like it might have back either in the days of film or in the days of, you know, DSLRs. Yeah. And I think this is something where we're going to have to start to see Canon and Nikon change their tune a little bit mm -hmm. because Nikon has never added major features through firmware right. and Canon's done it twice, basically right. with the 7D and the 5D too. Uh, and I think that's the way that the industry is going and they're going to have to wise up to it. Now, Canon has said with their R, we are committed to regular firmware updates. And I was like, that is exciting until mm -hmm. I used the camera and I was like, are these just bug fixes because you <laughs> rushed this thing to market? Uh, so yeah, I hope really. we see maybe major feature upgrades. Otherwise, that's, again, going to give an edge to uh, Fuji especially, but Panasonic as well have been doing regular awesome oh, yeah. firmware updates for it, uh, where they're adding real features to it and things that people are actually requesting. Yeah, and I guess as, you know, if the market is going to kind of shrink with just even the, you know, the, the crop sensor camera buyers just saying, screw it, my smartphone's good enough. I mean, manufacturers yeah. don't really have much of a choice but to really cater to what their remaining customers want. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, Panasonic, um, Olympus to some extent, Fuji, mm -hmm. Sony has been a little bit slower in this regard, but they do seem to be somewhat receptive on a, not necessarily in terms of, hey, we're going to release new firmware that gives you what you want, but like, hey, we'll think about putting that in maybe the next camera type of yeah. thing. Um, and I can I can speak to talking to Sony a lot. It is pretty amazing how much you'll throw something in there and you'll see that pop up in the next camera mm -hmm. uh, on a lot of these press trips that we're starting to see more and more of nowadays. Um, yeah, there's generally engineers right there that you can talk to and say, hey, I'd oh. like to see this and this and this. Now, we are coming to realize that we're basically becoming unpaid consultants for these <laughs> companies. <laughs> but if it means a better camera right. at the end of the day, I, I think that's the most important thing. Well, you're, I mean, yeah, you're unpaid consultants, but in some ways you're also the best people or the to audience, ask, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, not only are you reviewing these products, so... It gets kind of interesting there in that you're trying to be impartial and offer your opinion on the product as it is, but at the same time, you're kind of feeding directly back to these companies, hey, here's, you know, kind of ahead of time, here's what I really think about this camera. You guys need to, you know, work on this, but you're yeah. also using those products for a living. So you're not mm -hmm. just reviewing the dog food, you're eating it too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, Fuji's a great example of that, because uh, I shot with the X-T2 in New York when that thing first came out, and I sent a laundry list of things like, this is why I wouldn't use it to, you know, I'll use it absolutely to make a fun film or mm -hmm. something like that. I wouldn't use it to pay the bills, and here's why, and right. gave him a big form. And then the X-T3 came out, and it's crazy how many of those things mm -hmm. had been addressed. Uh and I think that it's going to get more and more competitive right now. Mm -hmm. So the companies that do that well are going to really start to stand out. Right. Well, Jordan, we have definitely passed our 30 minute mark. So the cameras, oh, both cameras held up with aplomb. Um, All I'm right. It, it was worth the little... GH5 investment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, for the amount episode. I record a clip longer than a half hour is pretty scarce. So this was great. Money well spent. Exactly. Yeah, I know. I'm, I don't even want to think about how much money I am into this system, but um if it's less frustrating and actually gets the job done that's all that matters um thank you this was awesome yeah. talking to you um for everyone else watching and listening jordan and chris fantastic reviews um well-seasoned opinion on all this kind of stuff they're at dp review um which is and w that was an interesting kind of switch for you too oh yeah um, we can talk about that quickly yeah yeah because you i i feel I'm trying to word this carefully. I don't mean Ooh. any ill by this, but you left a 300 something thousand subscriber channel for a, you were under a hundred K when you started at DP we were, review, I yeah, think I th 55. Yeah. So, I mean, you've definitely grown dramatically, but still not as big. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that had to have been a little scary. Uh, it, it was a big trade off for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and it's funny it, when I first moved over, I was like, no one cares about subscribers. Like all that matters is the views at the end right. of the day. Right. right. Uh, is how I looked at it. And then I realized if you don't work for a big camera company and you have to talk to suppliers to get stuff, the only question that they ask you when you jump over is how many subscribers do you have? Right. Especially when you're looking for accessories. Right. I mean, having the name DP review helps a lot with the yeah. big camera manufacturers, but right. you know, if we're looking at video accessories and stuff, it's funny. Um, you know, how little clout that might actually have. So it was definitely a big shift for us. But at the end of the day, we were kind of restricted in terms of how well we could actually test stuff because we're right. on the floor full time. You know, we shot the show primarily on our own time. Right. Um, and especially testing was done exclusively on our own time. Um, and, you know, it's it's a big audience and a big responsibility if you're putting mm -hmm. up a video that you know a few hundred thousand people are going to be watching oh yeah you want to make sure that you're right about everything and i we were really kind of feeling like look we're not able to back up a hundred percent you know we could say like here's what i'm experiencing right but um actually having you know people who are dedicated testers and stuff like that it's been amazing where we can just say you know like with the recent nikon z6 video um we were like i think it's focusing slightly faster than the seven it's getting to the subject once it's tracking them it's basically the same as the seven but it seems to be jumping and then we could actually get people to mm -hmm. back that up for us and they're amazing at what they do there's a reason they're the biggest photography gear website in the world is because they're excellent testers and know what they're talking about so mm -hmm. having that and still being able to you know so many people were concerned like oh is it going to change the tone of the show and stuff um and you know we were in seattle drunk playing drunk pictionary uh <laughs> just a couple of weeks ago um you know yep. so all those we've got another mirrorless party coming up yep. uh when Nichols will be making a return in the new year so we've been able to just keep producing our show but now you know we know we're on point with any technical observations we make, we can review right. cameras better now. And Chris is still Chris and I'm still me. So it, it's been really great, but yeah, we do want to certainly build the audience more. Right. And I would say DP review got a really good deal. Cause I mean, you know, you guys had made names for yourselves on the camera store channel, but I don't, I mean, let's be honest that's just a one-off store in calgary right yeah. it's not like you were just that was just your vehicle what really was going on is you and chris were making names for yourselves and the camera store was just kind of the moniker that the channel was going by right so dp review i think got a hell of a deal picking you two guys up and i love the fact that the videos didn't change i mean i remember watching the first one after you switched and like yeah. the only thing that was different was the card at the beginning and the card at the end. <laughs> it was like, yeah. it, it was like you could have put anything there and it would have been like, oh, it's the exact same kind of content as, as everyone's used to seeing. Yeah. Um, and that's what I really like. They've been very hands off in that regard. You know, like we want to grow yeah. the channel. You guys know what you're doing. So right. go do it, have fun. Um, and we'll just make sure, you know, that when, before you post it, everything you say is on point. Right. And that's got to be, yeah, really reassuring because now you actually have like coworkers who you can ask questions of and get additional input from. Um, yeah, exactly. And obviously in any review, you're not going to be able to really pick up a camera and cover it top to bottom completely because the, the yeah. review would be way too long. So you have to pick and choose what you want to address versus what don't you want to. It's got to mm -hmm. be nice to have other people where you can get their feedback, not just in terms of you know, what is your experience with this camera, but what do you think we should cover in the review? Yeah, exactly. And it is really nice too, to just be able to say like, uh, you know, rolling shutter is not great on this camera for more, check out the full review, you know, things mm -hmm. like that as opposed, or, um, a recent one that came up is just like 4k photo mode. We generally dedicate every Panasonic camera two minutes, two to three minutes to explain what it is, why it's useful. Mm -hmm. And now just to be able to say like, yeah, go check out the article or, you know, we'll put <laughs> yeah. a video together. Right. Uh, it just lets us streamline the show a lot because mm -hmm. what we what video does well is what is the experience of using this? Right. What video doesn't do very well is like, 
how does the image quality stack up to six other cameras? You know, right. like since we've jumped over, I have shot one high ISO test. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm just like, yeah. you know, throw up DP reviews, lab test on the screen, throw up some image samples. Right. And if you really want to sit there and click through and compare how 20 different camera models sensors stack up at one to one magnification, uh, you can do that. But I don't have to cater to you. In my <laughs> Yeah. So I think it was a great deal. Um, I know a lot of people are apprehensive at first whenever any big changes, you know, like that with channels happen. And I think kind of a parallel one, um, I imagine you've, you've probably even met the guys, but the whole digital rev, what yes. happened with them, um, Kai and Locke, but they're doing fine on their own too. So, yeah. you know, change can be scary, but it can be for the best. And I, for one, I'm glad that, uh, that, I guess things really haven't changed ultimately for you and Chris and yeah, subscribers yeah, I, are just a number, right? Yeah. Well, and Kai, Kai and Locke, it's a different situation because they're in different continents right, now. Um, right. So that would, you know, it did necessarily change the style. And I think, uh, you know, they've both done a great job of kind of moving over to a more vloggy style yeah. thing. But I, I think one of the things I love that very few shows are doing is Chris and I as a cameraman host, combo right uh there's not that many left i mean no. you look at uh like jared poland still doing that format even the northrups are mostly in their studio now mm -hmm. there's not many people doing that so i was really happy to be able to maintain that it's something it's a format that i'm really drawn to and that's part of why yeah. i love digital rev in the early days oh yeah they were they were doing that it was the chemistry the between the two of them and it's the same thing with yeah. you and chris right i mean yeah. i think everyone i mean let's uh, digital rev did good work reviewing stuff but let's be honest, the most memorable episodes were the ones where Kai was painting cameras hot pink, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, throwing stuff around, being stupid, you know, and it was the chemistry between him and Locke, the whole straight man, funny man kind of thing, which you and Chris have going as well, which works fantastic, we play into that right? for sure. Yeah. I mean, and sometimes you think that Chris is just this absolute narcissist, but I imagine he's just the biggest teddy bear in person. So it, it, it makes for a... That, that, oh. That's for the people watching the video feed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the truth comes out. Anyway. so, <laughs> uh, But yeah, it, it is a, a dynamic we wanted to maintain. And the other big difference from Digital Rev to what we did is, you know, our split was pretty amicable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like my wife still does the Camera Store TV's channel. So right. we made sure that, you know, we let our management know what was going on there were mm -hmm. no surprises anything like that and mm -hmm. i'm i mean i need that store for support they're the best camera store in alberta oh yeah i'm still in there you know two to three times a week just like you know uh, i had a card corrupt yesterday so i had to go buy a sand disk card to get my key for memory card recovery software you know stuff yeah. like that uh it, it it's always nice to have an emergency uh company in town that you know mm -hmm. we're still on really good terms with there's going to be a really interesting dynamic going on. Maybe you can fill in because you left the camera store, but your wife still works there. And now she's on the show. What considerations does that have? Cause I personally don't really believe in competition on YouTube. I think there yeah. are so many viewers and so many different opinions that are worth watching that I don't really consider any other channel as in quotes competing with me. Yeah. But at the same time, when you're living with someone else who's doing the same thing that you're doing, can you speak to that a little bit? Like, you know, you two are working on a review of the same product. Yeah. There's got to be some kind of concerns going on there, right? Well, I mean, we both talk to each other about the, the big issue is if one of us is on an NDA and the other's not like uh, a, that's when things can get, you know, it's like, right. I'm going to go play with the thing I can't tell you about. You know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's when things can get a little bit more difficult. But otherwise, I mean, object, you know, I don't think a review should be like, what's your hot take on this camera mm -hmm. that you don't, you know, I think it should be like, here's who it's for. Here's objectively what I think it's good at. And I don't think there's a problem with the two of us discussing that, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of the time, some of our conclusions might come out quite similar right. because, you know, objectively cameras are good for some types of photographers and not good for other ones. Um, but there's still a real degree of, you know, I am a more tech centric kind mm -hmm. of guy than my wife is. She is very much about the handling and the experience and stuff like that. Hence, mm -hmm. you know, I'm always out with a Panasonic or, you know, before that Sony. And then she was generally shooting Nikon DSLR now to 
enjoying the Fuji mirrorless cameras. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's two different takes, but it hasn't been really that difficult to transition or anything like that. Okay. Um, you know, and occasion like it happened recently where she was like, oh, here's an idea that I'm thinking of for this episode. And I'm just like, damn it, I wish you hadn't told me that. That's a way better <laughs> angle than what I had for the other and vice versa. You know, right. we don't, we're not going to copy each other on that. Right. But it has been, you know, I still want the camera store's channel and store to do well, because mm -hmm. like I said, I need it for gear and I need her to stay employed. <laughs> So we're neither of us are trying to burn any bridges on right. anything. Well, it's good to hear that it sounds like both of you know both of yours employers um, are just pretty cool with the whole situation and and well trusting. And I think you're right when when it comes to reviews, you know the only time when it probably is an issue is if there's some sort of exclusivity thing going on. Yeah. Otherwise, you're probably going to release reviews around the same time as each other anyway. Yeah, uh, the Z6 is a good example. Uh, last night at 2 a.m., uh, she sent her draft for hers, and ours went live at 1 a.m. <laughs> so like, could we maybe stagger these to be yeah, like really. a day apart, or even a few hours, you know? But Yeah, looking forward to the next few years. Looking forward to, uh, to the videos that you and Chris put together. Again, for everyone, I'm sure a lot of people watching this are already familiar. Um, but go check out uh, Jordan and Chris's reviews, DP Review. I'll include a link to their channel down in the description. Just fantastic. Thanks. I've been watching them for years. Um, I, I can't think of a better duo to, to review cameras. And again, Jordan, thank you so much for, for being on the show. This was a ton of fun. Thanks for having me on. Maybe we'll do it again when we find out what Act 2 on the full frame shootout is. Absolutely. I'm game. Awesome. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.